did two pieces of homework over the weekend. We're going to get right into checking the first piece here right now, uh, which uh, page 462, the practice problems on page 462, related to impulse graphs. I'm going to ask you one quick question before we go over this, uh, and that question is, when you see a force versus time graph, or they ask you to plot a force versus time graph, you should think three words. And the only question I'm asking you here before we check this homework is, what are those three words? Area equals impulse. Right away. Okay, it doesn't matter what you're asked. It doesn't matter if you're asked for impulse, if you're asked for the mass, if you're asked for the change in velocity, if you're asked for something else, think three words, area equals impulse, because that's what you're going to do no matter what, no matter what you're being asked for. All right, let's take a look at 462. Any issues with 462 here? Sorry? Uh, so we'll get number one. Uh, question number one, C is what was asked, but we'll go over the whole thing because it kind of needs the whole thing to do it here. It says, draw a graph of the net force as a function of time for a 0 .650 kilogram basketball being shot. During the first 0.15 seconds, the force increases from 0 to 22 newtons. So here's my graph here. Here's my axes, force on the y-axis in newtons, time on the x-axis in seconds. We're going during the first 0.15 seconds from 0 to 22 newtons. So we're going to say this is... 22 newtons, and we're going to say this is 0.15 seconds. Now, this isn't going to be drawn to scale, right? I could draw this to scale, but it doesn't. It, for what we need, the purposes for which we're using this, we don't need it drawn to scale as long as we have our numbers labeled there. During the next 0.25 seconds, so that takes us up to 0 0.4 seconds, right? Then in the next 0.25, um, what does it do? It decreases linear to 0 newtons, so it's going to go down. Here, there it is. There's my graph. Okay, we're good. How many people managed to get that? Okay, good. Using the graph, calculate the magnitude of the impulse. Well, we think area equals impulse, right? So let's do that. Uh, area is equal to impulse, which, uh, of course, because it's a triangle, we're going to say one-half base times height. Now, I remember one question that I did. Um, as a demonstration in front of a class one time a number of years ago, looked something like this. And to calculate the area, I said, oh, wait, it's a triangle. Okay, let's break it down into two sections, make it two right angle triangles, calculate the area of this one, calculate the area of this one, and then add them up. Does that work? Is it necessary? No, not at all. Do we need a right angle triangle to use one half base times height? No, we need one half, We need a, a right angle triangle to use sine, cos, or tan, but not to use one half base times height. So that was just, that was twice the amount of work that I needed to do, and I'm just not I'm not sure what was going on with my brain that day, but it works. I mean, it works. It gets us the right answer. It's just a lot more work that we need to do. Uh, one half base times height once is sufficient. Base is 0 0.4. The height is uh, 22 newtons. Uh, and the answer were there, I assume, works out to be 4.4 newton seconds. What's the other set of units, by the way, that you could use for this besides newton seconds, Carrie? No, but you're close. Kilograms times meters per second, not kilograms per meters per second. Right? It's mass times velocity, kilograms times meters per second. All right, C, which is the question that Alora actually asked here. Uh, what's the speed of the ball when it leaves the shooter's hand? Well, it starts at rest. Right? So the initial velocity of this is going to be 0 meters per second. We know the mass of this is 0 0.650 kilograms, and VF is, VF is what we're looking for here. We know that we can set that impulse that we just calculated equal to M times delta V. Why can we not... Why are we not going to set that impulse equal to F times T? Well, we're not looking for F, right? I mean, I guess you could say it's because it's not going to help us. But what's the problem in using F times T in one of these problems? Yeah. Uh, well, not so much the time. We could say 0 0.4 seconds right, for the time, but what force do we use? The force is changing. Delta T is a time interval. So this interval represents delta T just fine.
but F is not an interval. F is a constant or average force, not a change in force or a maximum force. It's a constant or average force, and we don't know what that constant or average, well, it's not a constant force. We don't know what that average force would be. So don't even try using F times delta T, even if it looks like it should work. All right, let's rearrange this to solve for delta V now. It's delta P over M, and delta P is 4.4. .4. M is... Uh, what do we say it was 0 0.650. And when we do that, it works out to be 6.8 meters per second. Now, this is the change in velocity. Um, if you were looking for the final velocity, I guess that's what we're looking for, right? The final speed. If the initial velocity is zero, then the change in velocity is the final. If the initial velocity is not zero, it starts at a certain speed already, then we would have to say, oh, delta V is equal to VF minus VI solve for this, 6.8 meters per second, um, and then add VI to the other side to get VF. Make sense? I think that's what you got to do in question number two, actually. Uh, no, actually, question number two asks you to solve for the mass. So same kind of thing. Get the change in velocity in question number two, C. Get the change in velocity. Um, divide it by the change in momentum. Solve for the mass that way. Same thing, except you're solving for a different variable. Good. Okay, the other one we had was uh, worksheet number two, and it was question number nine on that worksheet. Let's just take a look at that, regardless of whether we need that going over or not. It says, calculate the impulse experienced by the four kilogram object and calculate the change, the object's change in velocity. Right away with thinking, area equals impulse. So let's do that. Once again, it's a triangle, one half base times height. The base here is going to be 10 seconds, and the height here is going to be four seconds, four uh, newtons, I should say. One half of 10 times four is going to give me an impulse of 20 newton seconds. That's the first part of the question. Now, we want to find the change in velocity. Once again, we're going to say P is equal to M times delta V, not M times V. Impulse is never M times V. Impulse is always M times delta V. Um, rearrange it to solve for delta V. We already got the impulse. It's 20 divided by the mass of 4, so the de change in velocity is going to be 5 meters per second. Again, if we had the initial velocity already, then we'd set that change in velocity that we just found equal to Vf minus Vi to solve for Vf. We don't need to do that here at all. Good. Have a look up here now. We see, uh, once again, a force versus time graph. This time we're given the mass, and we're given the change in velocity. The question that I want to ask you now, what's the maximum force? What's the maximum force that this that uh, is applied on this object? Given the mass, given the change in velocity, and given, notice what you see on the x-axis, notice what you don't see on the y-axis, no numbers on the y-axis. Basically, we're looking for this number right here, the maximum force. We'll give you a second to work on that at your desk, and then we'll take a look at that as a group in a second. Let's have a look at the question here now. Hey, you see this graph? We don't know what's on the y-axis. We're not told any values for force here, but what are the first three words that you think of when you see this graph? What are the first three words? Good, area equals impulse. We know it's going to be area equals impulse even if we can't actually find the area. Don't worry about that. Okay, let's say area equals impulse. And we know that impulse, that area is equal to one-half base times height because it's a triangle. All right. Okay, let's see what we can do here. Okay, delta P, oh, we don't know it. Uh, one-half of base, uh, we know that. It's 0 0.3. Height, we don't know that. Okay. Let's deal with it some other way then. Okay, we know that if we're trying to find delta V, then we're going to set the impulse that we calculate equal to M times delta V. Hey, since we know what M and delta V are, let's multiply those numbers together to get the impulse this time. 4 times 8 gives me 32. Look, the impulse is 32 newton seconds. Now I can set the impulse that I just calculated using M times delta V equal to the area. 32 equals one-half of 0 0.3 times the height. Um, take the half over 64 divided by 0.3 to 13.3 repeating. Thank you. And the height is going to be newtons, right, not meters. Hey, what's the maximum force? 
213 newtons. Look, the height is the maximum force there. Done. Round it to two or three digits or whatever we need to round it to here, but uh, that's it. Okay. Does this change how we think about this question? No. Does it change slightly how we solve it? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, we, st we said area equals impulse. That's still what we got to do, except that we're not going to find the area using 1F base times height. We're going to find the area using M times delta V. But we still need to use this whole concept of area equals impulse here. Nick? Um, so why are we just doing action times, you know, Okay, good question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, why can't we just say F times T? Did you try that, Nick? Yeah. And you didn't get the right answer, did you? Uh, I'm going to guess you got 106, 120, okay, sorry, you got 106, okay, might have been a rounding thing in there somewhere, somewhere earlier on, because um, I think you should have got about 106.6 .6 or something like that. Um, so, remember what I said here uh, on Friday when we introduced this, and then earlier today when we were reviewing it, is just don't use F times T, but if you do use it, why doesn't it work? Why isn't it going to work? Here's the deal. Um, this impulse is the impulse uh, over the entire graph, the change in momentum over the entire graph. So there's no issue with delta P there when we look at this graph. Delta T, same deal. That's the time interval from the beginning to the end, from 0 to 0 0.3 seconds. This F, that's the problem. This F is the average or constant force. It's not a constant force. Okay, You can clearly see that it's changing. So it has to be the average force. What's the average force? I don't know. Okay, we calculate it. When we calculate this using delta P, 32 over the time, and we get, what was it, 106 or whatever it was? What have we just solved for? Not the max force. We've solved for the average force. Make sense? Um, actually, I don't think it is going to be 106. I think you might be right, actually. 110 or what did you say? One one twenty, whatever it is. Okay, whatever it is is the average force. Now, if this was uniform and this was right smack in the middle at point one five, then the then the max force would be twice the average force. Okay, but that's not the case here, so we can't just say, oh, it's one twenty. That's the average force, not the max force. How do we get the max force from it? That's pretty tough. So just, just go ahead and do it this way, okay? Just even though occasionally this can work for you, occasionally it can work for you, just don't even try. First of all, because you're probably going to solve for the average force and write that down as your answer as opposed to find the max force from it. But even if you do recognize that it's not the answer, it's hard to get the answer from it. We're going to look at a couple multiple choice questions here now from your booklet. It's on page 11 or 12, I think, of your booklet. The questions that I want to do are questions 7 and 8. And because they go together, um, we'll just have you work on both of those at the same time. And then we'll take a look at the two of them as a group once you're finished. All right, question number 7 it says, Foundation piles for tall buildings are hammered into the ground using a pile driver. Pile driver is similar to the one shown below. It's a 900 kilogram hammer, a distance of 3.5 meters above the top of the pile, and then it allows it to drop. Um, you guys know, you ever see them doing this when they're building a building or maybe building a bridge? Maybe, maybe building this um, overpass or something like this? They literally have these, usually they're steel, like I beam piles. They stick into the ground, and then they use these pile drivers where they pick up this 900 kilogram hammer and then they drop it. Bang. And then they pick it up and they drop it. Bang. And then they pick it up and then they drop it. And every time they drop it, it hammers this, this pile into the ground, you know, a few centimeters. And they keep doing it over and over and over again until these steel beams are driven into the ground, to basically to ground level. Why do they do that? What's the purpose of that? One of the other things that these things we call this friction piles as opposed to just piles, friction piles. The whole point of it is to create a foundation for something heavy. You're building a big building, 
Um, you need a good solid foundation. You're building a heavy bridge or an overpass, you need a good solid foundation. By driving these things into the ground, you create a good solid foundation. Why? Because the further you drive them into the ground, the more dirt you're displacing, and the more dirt you're displacing, the harder the dirt pushes back, right? You have to push the dirt more away. As uh, or, or the I-beam does as it's going down to the ground. The dirt has to push back harder. And the harder the dirt's pushing back, the more friction's acting on this beam, this I-beam. So the further you drive it into the ground, the more friction is acting on this piece of steel. And the more friction that acts on this piece of steel makes it even harder to sink into the ground even further. So you, you, you put in a dozen or two dozen or three dozen of these things, and it becomes really, really difficult for the mass that's sitting on it, that is the bridge of the building, to actually make it fall down even more. Does that make sense? It's literally, it's, it's incredibly simple, right? It's literally just drive these things into the ground, build a building on top of it, right? All right, we want to find the magnitude of the impulse delivered by the hammer to the pile. So what's going on here? Qu clearly the question is an impulse question. We've got a change in momentum going on here, right? A, a gain in momentum of this pile as it falls from the top to the bottom as it's dropped. How far is it dropping? Three and a half meters. We want to find that change in momentum, that change um, or that uh, gain in momentum as it falls from where it's being held up here by this pile driver to down here where it hits the pile. What, so what do we got here? Um, we got a mass of 900 kilograms. Knowing that it's impulse, we've got a mass of 900 kilograms. We know that the, the hammer falls uh, 3.5 meters. We're going to make its displacement negative 3.5 meters. Um, that's all we got, isn't it? VI would be zero. And we're going to say we're looking for delta P. We're looking for the impulse. We know that delta P is equal to F times delta T. And we know that it's equal to M times delta V. All right. So what do we do? Um, you probably use the first part of it, right? Since we're looking for impulse, but what next? F times T or M times delta V? Who thinks they got this question? Yeah, Merrick, what'd you do? How'd you find VF? Okay, the, one, the way that we've found VF quite a few times, right? Except not in an impulse question. We've, we've done that using uh, just in a momentum question, right? Same deal, though. VF squared is equal to VI squared plus 2AD, or you could have used EI is equal to EF. That's zero, so it's the square root of 2 times negative 9.81 times the displacement of negative 3.5. And Eric, what did you get for the final speed there? Thank you. That's the final speed, which is okay since we're looking for the magnitude of the impulse here. So let's say delta P is equal to... Uh, 900 kilograms times um, the change in velocity, that's going to be 0 minus 8.2. You know what, let's say, let's use it as velocity. Okay, You get away with it if you don't worry about a direction here, but I'm going to show you why in just a second here. 0 minus negative 8.2867. And Merrick, what did you get for the answer there? Okay, so 7,458 or 7.46 times 10 to the 3 or 7.46 kilonewton seconds. Good? That's a positive value, right? We're only looking for the magnitude, so even if we got a negative value, it wouldn't be the end of the world. But why should it be positive? Like if we're taking account direction, why is it positive? What if we go ahead? Okay, okay. Um, here's the deal. What have we actually found here? We've found the impulse provided to the pile. The the imp, the pile was moving downwards. Okay, it's gaining momentum downwards. What kind of force is required to stop a pile that's moving downwards? 
An upward force, right? What direction is an upward force or what sign is an upward force? Positive. If the force is positive, then the impulse has got to be positive too. In other words, if you have to have an upward force to stop it, then the impulse will be upwards as well and therefore a positive value. Okay. Again, if you got a negative value for that, you'd still get the answer here. But that's why it should technically be positive. All right, number eight says, delivered in this amount of time, what's the magnitude of the force that the hammer exerts on the pile? Well, this time we're going to say F times delta T. We've got impulse 7, 4, 5, 8. The force is what we're looking for. And the time here was, do we have it? Oh, yes, 2.1 times 10 to minus 3. And what did that work out to be? Next, you get that one? 3.55 times 10 to the sum, 6. 3.55 times 10 to the 6 newtons. That's a big force, right? I mean, you can imagine to stop a 900 kilogram thing that's just fallen three and a half meters, it's going to take a big force. Uh, 3.55 is going to be our answer. We'd record that as 3.55 since we're just looking for the base there. All right.